What's going on? How's it going? All right, one, one person's pretty psyched. All right, I'll take it. Um, I'm Jennifer, I work here. Um, I'm a little low energy. I woke up in London this morning and I just could not miss this show. So I had to write on a post-it so I didn't forget what to say. Um, if you have not already switched your phone into airplane mode, this is a good time to do that. Silence those things. Um, your drinks have already been served. There's not gonna be more. You got them though, you're good, you're good. Um, anyone here for the first time? Nice. Thank you so much. So the Green Space is part of New York Public Radio. You'll hear a little bit more about that during the show tonight. I um, hope you'll come back, follow us on all the socials, newsletters, all that kind of good stuff. We'd love to have you back here. Is anyone a member of New York Public Radio? WNYC, WQSR, nice. A fine showing. Um, we are member supported. So if you like independent journalism and or classical music and or theater, you know, this is the kind of stuff we do here. So get on board, you get a tote bag. It's a win-win. Um, that's all I really have to say. So now I'm going to turn it over to the mighty Zeus from whose brow this show has sprung, Steve Cawson. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great. I'm just going to give you just a little bit of context for what you are about to see tonight. So uh, I am the artistic director of the civilians, and the civilians are enjoying an uh, artist in residence. <clears throat> excuse me, on a, a residency here at the Green Space at WNYC. And we have been using this residency as a kind of opportunity to experiment with both how we interact with a public radio station and also how we make theater. So for the first performance that we did uh, last month, we made theater using chat GPT and other forms of AI. Oh, some of you saw that which was a lot of fun, had never done that before. Uh, and then for this show, uh, Jennifer's idea was, you know, would you want to maybe try to come up with something to do with the WNYC archives? And I love archives, so I said yes. Uh, and I uh, got connected with the amazing uh, Andy Lancet, who is the archivist for WNYC. Uh, <laughs> round of applause there. Uh, who steered us towards all sorts of interesting content. And uh, yeah, then I just sort of started to dig through the archives that are available on the WNYC homepage, if you want to check them out yourself. Uh, I was drawn first to this program I found called uh, Art Forum uh, from the 1970s. It was uh, uh, managed by the Anthology Film Archives, if you know that place, and they... Uh, featured a number of interviews with, with experimental filmmakers. Uh, Yvonne Rayner came from that one, and Kenneth Anger, and uh, 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 George Kuchar. People who I love. So <laughs> I started listening to people that I love the most, uh, and, uh, and then got into the archive deeper and deeper and found a few more amazing people. And then so I kind of very quickly wrote a script, uh, and our amazing sound designer, Ryan edited that together to create the, the audio for this show, which you will not hear out loud because it's being piped into the ears of these uh, very intrepid actors who started with uh, working on this with me on Wednesday. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the show is coming straight from the archives and going into their ears and hopefully out of their mouths. <laughs> and it's a bunch of different <laughs> interviews uh, spliced together. It's a great big, so if you just join us in the spirit of experimentation, and whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen, and we'll embrace it. So uh, enjoy the show. Thank you. <laughs> This is the WNYC FM. On a very simple level, all I did was tip up the floor to make a, a vertical plane rather than a slight problem that Bobby was um, living the part of Lucifer off screen as well as on. One thing together, the strength of the nation, the glory of the creator. You just put your fingers on certain electrodes and certainly there you are holding the, the Rodin. 
I mean, I don't see why that's theoretically not possible to do. No, not not exactly that. The other way we're looking at perhaps might be uh, closer. Uh, let's say that a lot of artists today, in a sense, raise artificial obstacles. The public has to will fight them their way over the obstacle to reach the art holy land. And really, sort of striving and getting there is part of the work of art. It's part of the mystique of the relationship of the artist to society. Totally, totally meaningless uh, distinction, the art and the society. Uh, most art today does not fulfill any interesting social functions whatsoever. I agree. This is the WNYC-FM Arts Forum, a weekly meeting place for the discussion of new ideas in the avant-garde arts. Tonight's forum focuses on the visual and synergistic arts. If I can say something here, that, that's really what's wrong. We always, um, traditionally in America, the American tradition is to consider the, the, the artists are bringing culture to the people, and that's not really what's going on. What happens is that culture comes from the people, and if we can learn that in America, I think we'll be more on the right track, because you can't just create something in the abstract. You can't just take bits and pieces of um, uh, many different pieces, ideas, and, and paste them together and, uh, in, in a juxtaposed manner and say, this is culture, and then feed this to the people and demand that they accept that. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why many people are not aware of, don't um, appreciate um, paintings hanging in a painting in a gallery. Because the whole way that it's been structured is that with the attitude that we are bringing culture to these people, and it's really the people who are bringing culture to themselves, culture just kind of rises out of people's way of life. It's how they live, it's who they are and, and, and what they are, and without people being directly and actively involved, whatever is that happening, and that's what's considered to be culture or cultured. It's not valid. It's, it's just not real. <laughs> Do you ever use the cut-up method where you will take um, a piece of paper, and by this day is a fairly common technique among poets. I think Burroughs must have been the first. Uh, Burroughs and the Dadaists and some of the Surrealists must have been the people who inspired every contemporary poet just to use outside I don't think sources. It's, it's not only common, I think it's vulgar. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I can't, uh, I can't see the point of uh, indiscriminately uh, uh, taking a, you know, Newsweek or what have you and clipping it up and, uh, you know, pasting it together and then handing it out as uh, something that I did. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, uh, Chance Methods, you know, it's not what I'm, uh, I'm not interested in Chance Methods. Mm. I'm interested in, in uh, putting uh, the language together in a meaningful way and I don't think, uh, I, I cut them all up together. I made half-hour film by using um, almost a blindfold process. I cut all the scenes up, jumbled them all up, threw them into a cutting bin, and then I would just go like this. I've invited Yvonne Rayner to come and talk with me during this first session of my own of the Arts Forum. And I've done so uh, because she is the woman artist whose work I have followed with particular interest for a number of years. Uh, she has, uh, as I said, she's been dancing and thinking about dancing and she has a thought. Uh, she has, uh, has worked with artists, uh, particularly uh, sculptors, and she has as well in recent years uh, turned to making film. Mm. Well, uh, starting from um, where I am now, I might, on a very simple level, all I did was tip up the floor to make a, a vertical plane rather than a, a three-dimensional horizontal plane. Do you mean that, or is that a very nice sort of elaborate metaphor? In a way, it's true. I, uh, uh, I've become uh, much uh, 
more uh, fastidious in this in working on this second film in in framing the image um, uh, it took me, I think, the whole duration of that first film, which incidentally is called Lives of... Did you mention that? Lives of Performers? No, I didn't. Thank you. <laughs> you might describe it that way, Velda replies. It's also a story about a man who loves a woman and can't leave her when he falls in love with another woman. I mean, he can't seem to make up his mind. Or I could tell it from the point of view of the first woman. She loves him and endures his cruelty. Yes, cruelties. You see, from her vantage point, his weakness has become, yes, become cruelties. Yes, endures his cruelties because he always returns to her. And although she won't acknowledge it, she really does think, know, feel, that she can't live without him. Welcome to Arts Forum. I'm P. Adney Sidney, discussing the avant-garde film. And this evening, my guest is the very well-known uh, American independent filmmaker, Kenneth Anger, the maker of Fireworks, Scorpio Rising, Lucifer Rising, several other films. And his other nickname, particularly with the girls, was Cupid, which is the name that carried over into the Manson gang. But it, it's hard to think someone you know well is maybe a difficult person in some ways, but in other ways absolutely adorable, uh, can kill someone. <laughs> but he did it. Uh, I, I certainly <laughs> wanted to kill some people sometimes, but the difference is between wanting to and doing it. Uh, and maybe that's the difference of like, whether you keep your fantasies under control. I've certainly been angry enough at several people that if I had been in the room with them, I would have strangled them. At least I would have tried. One of them was, Maya Darren at one stage. Really? Oh, yes, I never met her in person, but, um... Oh, I'd always assumed you had known her. One, two, three. Uh, this is an open foot, but you're looking at the windows. It's behind, so now you go in that direction. Two, three. Your feet will reverse. Your gaze stays. No, your gaze... <laughs> is to the audience. Now you keep your body there. One, two. Keep your body there. Three. Keep your body there. Your gaze stays there. Now, now your body, your facing changes to the wall. One, two. Keep your face in. Three, keep in. Now we're going to reverse the feet as the gaze comes to the door. Hello again, and welcome to the continuing series recorded for WNYC called Poetry of the Avant-Garde. I'm Mike Silverton, and tonight's guest poet is Lorenzo Thomas, 22 years old. <laughs> I had to say it. Yeah, I'd like to start at uh, reading something that's, uh, uh, I don't know if it's avant-garde for you, but... Uh, Oh, we, 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 we've had problems with that expression before. I think both times, it's times people knocked out of shape uh, by I, it, but... Yeah. Good. It's called Uptown Talk. <laughs> people keep saying the truth will come out. Standing out on the streets, nodding darkly, flashing big bucks to prove it to you. You listen to them? You have a right to be evil if you have the potential. Nobody could stop you. This is a free country. And it's hardly surprising we have so many sad folk songs and ballads telling us how corny we could be if we tried just a little bit harder. Push just that much harder on our clue machines until the earth itself screams and gags it up for our ugly amusement park photos, showing us in the disarray of our needs the long white cardboard mask of desire momentum, which leaves us up some simpleton's dazzled green hills and the lovely fount he exposes in his negative thoughts about delirious struggles and tropical places. Like a musical comedy, that resurrection of things we no longer have any use for and generously distribute among those we fear. That we would gladly give them all we have but can't use, would give freely our heart since its value remains so depressing. But still, 
Let's keep novelty out of the wrong hands. Harlem exploded right after the country club set and the stars fell down on Lenox Avenue. Having drunk themselves into the ghetto, ashamed their last movies a dim success, stunning in black and white. An artistry that has no concessions to offer the poor, nothing to force on the lost brother, but the fury of a soiled Latin American delegate shown sitting in the Columbia cafeteria drinking soup and thinking of Maria, who is shown in a later scene calling to this man in the form of the haze of Up Harlem and Morningside Park. He is seen reading communist pamphlets amid the confused African jazz that sleeps in his mahogany desk, disturbed on the beautiful mornings by the unexpected dollar in his hand. You have the right to keep the truth from a dummy, though it is something you are no longer wanting to use. Other people do not look like big stars, and no schema will get them into signing a contract, which if they did, who would take care of the gardens and dig ditches for us to bury our folk songs? It, it seems in a way that, that uh, in a quest for certain extraordinary types in your films, uh, a, a kind of typecasting, you have on more than one occasion had, had problems because of the, 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 the very nature of some of the people you, you choose to film. I'm thinking of Bobby Beausoleil. And um, I, I thought this young man, he was 19 at the time, was the Lucifer I was looking for to play Lucifer and Lucifer Rising. And um, he was and is a very extraordinary, talented young man, a Scorpio, <laughs> with very uh, blue eyes and a very intense air about him and mischievous sense of humor, and uh, what you call a, a charisma, which some people have and some people don't. But uh, we ran into the slight problem that Bobby was living the part of Lucifer off screen as well as on. Lorenzo, uh, I detect that one of the strong components of your poetry is, uh, as well, if not outright protest, a sort of certain outraged feeling. Oh, uh, well, I wouldn't. Uh, this is absolutely absent in other people's work. And what is it to do with your I wouldn't your say work? it was absent. Outrage is like in, uh, you know, is a component of a lot of things that are, you know, on the scene today. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that what, what the, uh, the thing in, and my work is, is outrage. Well, then more directly, as a Negro poet, do you um, think that if there were not this great hostility and turmoil going on between the races in this country, do you feel that you would want to be a poet, that you would have something else to write poetry about? Well, I think it would be like a, like a terrible state of affairs if uh, what I did for my amusement you know, if that's, if you could call writing that, uh, was dependent on uh, all kinds of you know, terrible, you know, misery and uh, inequity out in the street or, you know. Well, let me understand this what, what, what I'm I... saying is that uh, I, I'd like to think that uh, if things weren't so terrible otherwise, that I could still do what I want. Don't you realize the implication of that? If everything is done for us, there will be no incentive. No need for personal achievement. Even now we're losing ground. Losing ground? Ground. Knowledge. Machines do all the work for us. Why should we learn mathematics when the computers can find the solutions better and faster? <laughs> we don't even control them anymore. The brains are designed by other brains. The robots improve themselves. We don't know how. We give them data, they give us answers. We only supply means to your ends. Yeah, our end. And uh, once I put together a film, 
that was made of uh, Escape episode and fireworks in an earlier film, Drastic Demise. I, I cut them all up together, I made a half hour film uh, using them almost a blindfold process. I cut all the scenes separate. I jumbled them all up. I threw them into a, a cutting band, and then I would just go like this, I put my hand over my eyes, and reach into the cutting band and pull out, uh, reach around to the bottom of the top or whatever, and, and pull out, uh, grab back fashion, whatever I happened to pick up, put it down, I would cut it to the next scene, which I would also reach in and pull and do this. And the way in which, the way to organize, to form a kind of structure. And, and it struck me also that in the film work, that is the material that you use is very, very daily, very banal material. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very much the stuff of, of a certain kind of modest existence, actually, mm -hmm. in Soho. Why do you, why do you talk about, you talk about that in your because, article? Because, well, because it, it is for me, Soho, Soho. very much infused uh -huh. somehow with a, a possibly. It's, it's terrible. And in, in the 40s, late 40s, I sent this grab bag film that I made to a very pretentious little film festival, a film competition, not a festival, uh, in New York City. And one of the judges was Maya Darren. And Maya Darren wrote me back this very um, scholarly, sort of school teacherly letter about why she couldn't give it a prize, even though she thought, she, she, she thought that certain passages of it had progress. Well, it's not terrible. No, it's not terrible. No. It's, it's what, what would seem to be wrong of you to deny that one is a, of a certain person, a certain person of a certain place and of a certain time. But it, it, it has to mm -hmm. me, in any case, a quality of a certain kind of modest, almost banal everyday existence of encounters and questionings and a lot of personal mm -hmm. experience. You well, know? Why, why, why is it restricted to Soho? I didn't say it was restricted. Oh. It carries for me the mark of a certain kind of, you know, person. You mean uptown people don't uh, meet each other on the street? Oh, of course they do. Se secret thoughts? Or <laughs> oh, of course they do. <laughs> <laughs> but the point, of, the point about Soho is it's a part of a big middle class New York, you know? Uh, uh, but... Uh, uh, I'm not convinced on that. It, it takes... But it takes place in a loft space. It's very much it's that kind of posterity. Oh, the loft space. Yeah. <laughs> so then I, I would do something cheap and obvious, and obviously show that I've been too much exposed to Hollywood, <laughs> uh, and that I should forget all about Hollywood. And then I wrote her back, and I said the whole thing was a joke. And she wrote me back, and she said, you're guilty of confounding the public. <laughs> and you're also guilty of pulling my leg. <laughs> And I'll never forgive you. And I said, Yeah, yeah. I see. No, yeah, not. right, right. Yeah, well, that, that's by default. I had no other place to... Uh... Well, you're not being either reproached or, or praised for it. Well, I, oh, I'm, 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 I uh, uh, respect your intentions. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and I said, well, she, she has such a lack of a sense of humor. So... Then, when Fireworks, a few years later, uh, maybe a year later, when Fireworks was first shown at the, I think it was the, um, well, it was shown in the village in some small little theater publicly in New York City. Maya Darren made a point of coming to the showing in a dress, black knit dress, um, uh, that um, was sewn from head to foot with little bells, like Christmas bells. Sleigh bells were sewn all over the dress. I mean, talk about an exhibitionist. And every time she'd move, she'd tinkle. <laughs> she sat down and um, made a very ostentatious entrance, noisy entrance into the showing in this tinkling dress. And when my film came on, um, she uh, tinkled her dress very loudly. <laughs> to, I, I think, express annoyance. And then as it continued, she said, oh, it's another one of these fairies. This is fairy propaganda. 
And then she made a very loud tinkle with her dress. She stood up and she stalked out, tinkling all the way up the aisle. Were you in the theater at the time? No, I had it described to me by several people <laughs> who were there. And I think that's the part, well, I, well, if I'd been there, I'd probably strangled her. <laughs> Thank you, and welcome once again to Artists in the City. My guests on this program have been artists who have moved their work out of the traditional settings of art galleries, concert halls, museums and theaters, into the streets and neighborhoods of our city. And today I'm extremely delighted to welcome Kimako Baraka, who is the producer and director of Nation Time Productions, a nonprofit theatrical organization whose latest project is a series of Nation Time street festivals, which are held this month in Harlem, in Bedford, Syvis, and neighborhoods. What do you feel happens in, in, in productions such as, as uh, the new kind of street festival? Well, once again, that's also an evolutionary process. I think that um, what happens is you, you ask me that, and I think that's really the point. That's why they exist, because of what happens. And what happens is that the people, quote, the community that everyone speaks of and, doesn't, and often um, doesn't relate to, these real people have a chance to participate actively in what's really happening. They become the actors. They are the musicians. They can be right there on their street, in front of the house. They can laugh aloud if they want to or not. They don't have restrictions and formalities uh, of sitting in an, um, a, a nailed down mm -hmm. chair in the theater. Um, for example, they, the sun is out. The air is clean and fresh. It's not false air conditioning giving false air. The whole thing is just a freer, healthier, uh, more alive experience. It sounds beautiful the way you describe it, and I think that what's been happening is that we know that the, again, the traditional institutional ways of, quote, bringing culture to people mm. um, seems somehow to be lacking in, in, in a, um, are they productions? Is it well, I don't really like to use that, but for lack of a better word, um, I guess, or a limited vocabulary, because the entire concept of things coming from the community the, the depth and the significance of, uh, quote, the community, the people that hasn't really been known and felt too much in this country except, you know, written down or in concept. But it actually hasn't been happening very much. So uh, I, I don't really like to refer mm -hmm. to it as a production. But at any rate, to go beyond that point, what happens is that we have artists who appear, musicians who play music, and people join in if they want to, and if not, they listen, or um, what is it if it's uh, what you might call a way out, or sound, or if it's rhythm and blues, or kind of danceable music, people feel free to dance in the street, actually. And um, we have poets, we have... Um, random and spontaneous as you hear it, and next will be edited and constructed. Here today, Harry Smith. So would you like to tell us about Mahagoni and your present film work? Well, P. Adams, uh, you've just gone through part of that. Things like uh, visionary cinema being confused with uh, film. The uh, only preliminary thing that I'd like to say is that uh, um, whereas Mr. Professor Sidney said very recently with these interviews, it's on the assumption that the radio audience is familiar with the works of Levi Strauss uh, regarding the 
stop sign and the go sign and the raw and the cooked. Animals being cooked and eaten by men. Particularly suggest uh, page 96, and you can throw away the raw and the cooked. Is that also, uh, face knowledge of uh, Chomsky <laughs> is necessary. Although, it's very much in that case, it's not necessary. You can... Uh, Get a little bit of Levi Strauss, skip the rest, and the Michigas, et cetera, et cetera. Chomsky needs to be looked at in the aspects of... Uh, Transformational agreement? No, 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 no. Aspects of the theory of syntax, um, which is, is a doctoral thesis, probably the best one Harvard's had since 16-something. Uh, it requires a little about Wittgenstein. In that case, it's not necessary to take the cellophane off the book uh, before you throw it away. <laughs> if you'd ask a few questions... Well, I, 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 but, but let the audience know first that the answers have nothing to do with the questions. <laughs> Unless the uh, up and the down is binomially binomially the the mispronunciation being the raw cooked part but uh, if you leave your home tonight examine the fire hydrants see if they're still green and red the same as they were i'm i'm uh i consider the uh, bibliography on the one hand uh uh quite puzzling on the other hand, uh, perhaps illuminating, but I would like you to tell us a little about the work you did on Mahagoni, how you plan to, principles by which you made the film, the way which you tried to exhibit it. Jung's theories regarding synchronicity have recently turned out to be true. For a long time, it was thought that Jung was merely some kind of heel being placed there just to see exactly how far the public will go in belief. But now, empirical truths have arrived from the University of California. I can't go into that. Uh, just see the Journal of the Psychological Research. And you will find out what you believe is going to happen, happens. For example, this evening, Professor Sidney thought we were going to be late, and he arranged it perfectly. Yes, well, we were uh, running late getting to the studio. Um, I, I, I see that we do not have an easy time getting onto the topic of this. Uh, Mahagoni, you just did it. First, there were the plants. They developed into animals which ate the plants. The animals were small, but they grew. And the larger animals ate the smaller animals. What does that mean? So far, according to history, each dynasty devises its own end. The animal develops a brain, and the brain destroys the animal. Our brains conceived you, robots. Are you threatening to destroy us? Oh, no. We are by no means sure that we are the next step. It's just that in view of the cycle, we are the best we have to offer to help you. The cycle is rather inexorable. And uh, I remember the dance we used to do, you know, when we were a little bit younger. And uh, which one of the various names Zai wrote one for that too. I call it here fish. I remember that. Oh yeah. 
The outlook for the morning calls for skies radiant with a mating song of beautiful sea creatures. From here, the ocean foam relates great events of human courage that come to this comic book vantage. We look forward to it. Great authors have arranged for us to be lazy. Pearl comes up to me this year selling Christmas cards to friends. Another way of filling the poor afternoons with the grandeur the civics lesson taught us to seize from our trivial labors. Every night, we wearing down the walls, deflecting our friendship from going down in flames and intends to glorify his name and language. We are as lazy as fish and big eyes that can only see to give us deeper. Yeah, think about it some more. The work piles up and continues to amaze you. How I feel in the morning doesn't matter. I'm not trying to be cute. It is so marvelous, but we wait for night before saying so and enjoy ourselves that much more under the trophy room's hurt fixation. We sit in here so seldom lately. Look, a man's got to work for a living, you know. What he cherishes must be valued with this fact understood. Maybe Norman's photograph, let her picture be a spirit that one man soon the nurture of force against the shapeless hierarchy of the shifting weather, the days riding off in cabs into the night, and the night left behind warms a girl just like a broken heart, which is the ambition of sadness. And one expects to find it situated, cantankerous behind the door, blue and white arrows around it, having begun to look like a realist, be realistic, mix your feet in the grind, let the force drop like the rain, and know that you share nothing of its nature, which is not true but will become true if you care to think so. And do what with your afternoons? Watch the beauty of it flow away behind the rainbow's busy traffic. Something fishy about this kid. Night warms a girl standing in it and warms ambitious father. He stands enthusiastic at the bar where the ordinary show appears. Drawing the star of David with my eyes reminds me of beggar songs who walk the streets down Rutland Street to sloppy eddies and fish market, begging buy sugar, begging the love of the beautiful people. All in my eye, the sound beggar songs. Huh, Jews used to be beggars. Thinking of Mulan, rapacious kid, on the fast streets, singers and merchants are meant to be just. We expect nothing of them. Their hands, the merchants, shine clean and white like Negro friends. The just merchant substitute our best intentions. We are preoccupied with dismal arts, both hands shining clean and white. They hover about the objects that make our lives the work of holiness. Huh. We even conceded, it seems. These objects reward the capital of our endeavor. We walk in the rain. It is like going to the movies. He stands enthusiastic at the bar. My own shadow over my shoulder talks to me, and it could be my father. He explains to me later, nothing can recall a novelty among experienced and honest men. Those white drugs, scornfully. Anyway, in, uh, in a concrete way, I'll ask the both of you what you expect to find in the museum, in your museum specifically, in uh, the year 2000, if you went to the museum. I think that I would find a lot of earlier 20th century art and that the, the closer you got to the year 2000, the less there would be. I don't... There would be less evidence. Yes, but, of any but, art. Because the art doesn't leave evidence behind uh, as we project into the future. Uh, what are you talking about? That there'd be fewer, fewer paintings, paintings or...? Uh, fewer <laughs> interesting works of art. That would be okay. apprehensible, uh, touchable, seeable. Viable and sellable. But, but where, where would the paintings be? Well, there will always be the paintings, you know. You could, the people, as I say, people having fantasy pictures. But sculpture and painting as cultural forms of expression are reaching the end of their life term, just as uh, museums of modern and contemporary art are beginning to reach the end of their cultural term. But you, you seem to say that you're presiding over a dying empire. I'm, I'm dealing myself out of a job. Well, the question I asked Ed before <laughs> was, do you believe that the museum is a closed-end institution? Yes. And I, I think his answer was yes. Uh, fascinating. Uh, what about your collection? You probably find more so of this on, uh, on your campus. Uh, w wouldn't you, I in this instance? Uh, I don't know that uh, the evidence of uh, art at NYU would be any different from the evidence of art at the Guggenheim Museum or the, or the um, Metropolitan. <coughs> I do believe mm. that um, the university's function will continue to uh, change 
in that they will accept, no, 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 not the function, but the university's uh, program will change to adapt itself to these changes that Ed is projecting. In other words. This is the Arts Forum, a weekly meeting place. Discussion of new ideas in the avant-garde arts. Tonight's forum focuses on the art of film. Your host is P. Adam Sidney, co-director of the Anthology Film Archives in New York City, professor of cinema studies at New York University School of the Arts, and author of the book, The Visionary Film. Here is P. Adams Sidney. Good evening. I have as my guest this evening, George Koshar, the filmmaker, who has written, but not directed, a film called Thundercrack, which will be shown Monday evening at 8 o'clock at the Anthology Film Archives. And yeah, anyway, we were in the kitchen and he proposed this idea to me, how would I be interested in writing a screenplay for uh, this movie, the pornography movie, and there were eight characters, and that he had taken a hallucinogenic drug, but his friend Mark, and they delved into their past, and they dug up all these characters that they were interested in, like to see, to see on the screen, uh, which were representative of themselves and other people that they found sexually appealing. So, because uh, you know, San Francisco is all in for sex. It's a high hell island, but, and sex is loose on that island, you know? <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I said, fine, I would like to do it. I think it'd be an interesting challenge because I wanted to go to also to Oklahoma because I'm interested in storms. <laughs> right, well, I was interested in uh, weather very much. So uh, I decided to, well, fine. Well, I'm gonna be in Oklahoma. I'm gonna stay at the YMCA, so it's gonna be pretty boring, you know, waiting for storms. So I said, well, I'll take uh, this idea with me, you know, and I will expand it and I'll make it into a, a big film and it'll be my biggest script. I don't know whether there'll be uh, uh, the Metropolitan and the Guggenheim and the Modern. It, it may be something quite different in the organizational necessities and the funding necessities and the program necessities of all of these institutions might change radically. Uh, and, and yet the Louvre has survived. Uh, the Impressionism but, but, but survived. But it's all this is very recent. Museums themselves haven't been in existence more than a, a hundred more years. With the Louvre, it's been around. No! So that's perfectly all right, though. You bring up the Louvre. Let's think of the Louvre. The Louvre has mostly things um, dating from <laughs> anywhere from 4,000 years ago up to uh, 25, 50 years ago. And they've survived in that capacity as, as a uh, repository, as a form of library. Right. But if you're talking about elimination of the museum today, then you have to really uh, think about what's happening to the artists who are furiously painting today. Very, very unhappy. Well, what's going to happen to them? <laughs> well, someone will take care of a them. A lot of them Some will of be them. destroyed. A lot of them will be lost. A few will end up in museums as documents of tastes of the period, of a certain kind of taste uh, related to a certain kind of sensibility and set of values. Will, will films take over where the canvas I, leaves off? I don't see how film and canvases are about the same thing. So I wrote from about 1 o'clock in the afternoon every day to uh, 4.30 when I went out to supper. And I wrote constantly, every single day. Sometimes I wrote uh, in the night, but I found that my creative point was from 1 to 4.30. 
And um, there was no feedback, you know, because I was there alone, and there was one person that I showed it to. He was about 21 years old. He used to clean the floors. And uh, he couldn't read or write. He was uh, brought up in Kansas. And I asked him what was wrong with the schools. You know, he didn't get a chance to read or write. So he came into the room, and I'd read him parts of Thundercrack. And uh, he seemed to like it. But he used to be in a room, and he used to take off all his clothes and said, do you mind if I look for bugs? Because he had lice, <laughs> you know? So he would be, uh, so I said, mm -hmm, you know, and I could go in his room. I said, it's all right, you know, it's his room. I, I didn't know what to say in his room, so he took off his clothes, looking for bugs on his body. So I said, you know, I, I'm not, I sat in a chair. I'm not going to sit on his bed. <laughs> I'm not going to risk getting bugs. <laughs> anyway, he's the only one, the only one uh, feedback. And then uh, uh, you, you do meet interesting people, but that was what I wanted. It was quiet. It was quiet, and I was alone. And I wrote that thing, and I was in ecstasy. Well, well, you can't get a painting over a television set. Nope. That they is one thing. They may that. Really? Texture and scale? Yeah, and sure. Why not? Well, you just I put your finger not. on it, and some electrodes, and suddenly there you are, and you're holding a Rodin. Sure. It's a very expensive thing to do, but it could be done. A few hundred million dollars in reconstitution. Uh, you know, the museum will be a historical a, action yes. yes and and perception of art if i may again be simplistic will revert to um a observation of a given a phenomenon with with traction in other words a demonstration no <laughs> no no and first of all don't say perception of art that is so misleading <laughs> But um, we ran into the slight problem that Bobby was um, living the part of Lucifer off screen as well as on. I mean, it was an aspect of his character, this sort of mischievous imp or fallen angel. And to make a long story short, we had a misunderstanding over money in which frankly he ripped me off and betrayed my trust and some money that should have uh, been used to buy some amplifiers for his band, um, I found went to buy some illicit substance, which arrived from Mexico in great plastic containers. And I was pretty upset over this. And when I found out what was going on, because it was a pure betrayal. And uh, if I can't trust someone I'm working with, I don't care to work with them, how, no matter how disastrous the consequences are. So that was the end of my... I terminated our working arrangement and I terminated our friendship at that stage. Now, two years later, he met up with Charlie Manson. And uh, I'd say that gang was bad company. I don't think Bobby would have ever gotten into quite such a kettle of hot water if he'd never met Charlie. But I will say this, um, Bobby was a child, he was 19, but some people are 19, can be more like nine, emotionally. And he was very, he was like litmus paper, a chameleon. He was very easily influenced. He was convicted of murder, was he not? Yes. He's now in Tracy, after a time in San Quentin. And he writes me, in, in other words, after a couple of years, no contact, I heard that he'd like to hear from me again, so I wrote him. And we now have a regular correspondence. Don't you realize the implication of that? If everything is done for us, there will be no incentive. No need for personal achievement. Even now we're losing ground. Losing ground? Ground. Knowledge. Machines do all the work for us. Why should we learn mathematics when the computers can find the solutions better and faster? <laughs> we don't even control them anymore. The brains are designed by other brains. The robots improve themselves. We don't know how. We give them data, they give us answers. 
We only supply means to your ends. Yeah, our end. Uh, what about computer art? Is that, um, is that something that's... I remember receiving in the mail uh, a, a pattern it was, that was created by a computer years ago. Uh, Very uh, it boring. Looked, it, looked, it looked like it was supposed to look like a Mondrian, a drawing of uh, 1914, I guess. And, uh, and, of course, it had some of the same pattern, but it had nothing else. Aha. Uh -huh. So perhaps was it perhaps programmed roughly the computer in relation to an early Mondrian. And so you all can get at best is a reproduction in greater or lesser fidelity of the limitations of programming put into the computer. But unless you uh, come to the development of intelligence, of something which is the same as a human brain or superior to that, which I don't think yeah. we're about to get to. But, but some people, uh, people that I, I've talked to, say that that's not at all science fiction, that it's coming, it's going to be here. And uh, like that becomes a big problem, because today we have uh, a grasp of, of, you know, like a vast store of trivialities. Yeah. You know, we have, we have computers that, uh, you know, you press a button and no time at all. You know, you can have a whole list of typed out trivialities before, you know. And, and like whether you should put that, record that too, you know, in poetry is a question. One, one, one great cultural metaphor for this is a very, very significant film is the uh, creation of the humanoids. A very great science fiction film, which is uh, very central to such uh, problematic uh, situations. But I if what you say comes to pass, it could also be within the realm of possibility that computers will then uh, be capable of papering the museums. What, where would we be without Marcel Duchamp's ready-made? Uh, yeah, where would we be? <laughs> I think we have time. We have about, I think, four more minutes. Do four you, more minutes? Do you have a poem for us? Okay, how long will it take? About four more minutes. Okay, all right, let's try it. This is called Home Thoughts. Listen to this. Jamaica, Long Island, the jaded streets, the boulevards, like a cameo tinged with green. Trees in 1934, we enjoy at the edge of our vision. Day in and day out, it's invisibility and wonder. 1934, the Prussian days that our state of mind had been anticipated so accurately, planting these trees, creating this atmosphere. Why can't we be more resentful? Sun, moon, planets and stars, the modern fabric of the Bauhaus mind, 1937 in New York City, Work Project Administration, planting trees along the streets of Jamaica, ambitious, the loneliness, WPA creating Flash Gordon out of the rummage of historical parents. How curious to wear a two-lane helmet on Venus, that our future is but a crimson tide to these men of the 30s who do not trust to a peaceful future. And we move into it like it was an attic. We love for its musty simplicity, boiled grandeur of its useless feather boa the young girl breathed heavily on. It is so far out and belonged to the grandmother their mother cleaned for. These scraps, the optimism of a New York Jew who a young girl wore this madness, became a dentist's wife, a colored girl twice a week. This space alone remains a, and we explore and move into it to force the old Atlantic City shoes on our big feet like the invisible slippers of Freud. Opportunism, fictions, shoddy on the young people rummaging, Negro and white, Negro and white, Jewish that ever we are bored to idleness and joy, the universe in a suitcase, Mrs. Goldberg's hand-me-down summer afternoons beside a lake polluted with the despair of the wild bird that turns bald in a hunter's release to ensure her conformity, awnings over the dark bay windows of the Sinai Desert upstate in New York State, and one Saturday, majestically given, Five door from the maid to furnish the attic, her new house in Jamaica, which is the madam's old house. She flees from as colored start coming from Harlem, from whence cometh her help. 
so that we young black men grow up angry at our own addicts. Our mothers have cleaned many mansions to give us, to clutter up with our wrath, that it would be much better white people leave their addicts alone when they run to the new suburbs and not have our mothers carry their failed lives in the street, adding our mother's misery, their, adrenal, their adrenaline sons and daughters who read Miss Anne's old romance novels thinking it's like that, thinking white people are like that and all people are like that, they think. Why can't we be more resentful? Let me tell you. Let me tell you, and you know that I don't lie. Black girl walk on the Ave, knew her name was Georgia, came from Georgia, made her that every variation I know. Check it out, sisters. It was always told me the lies of the saints. It's full of endless changes. Get down and work even in heaven, kneeling down hour by hour, scrub the space around us we live in to cleanse our minds. Sign up in Georgia and be maids in New York. What is this, Georgia? Saint home, beautifully redeemed from our desertions. We all the time walk the streets and go other places and walk the streets which should be the only first steps of our repatriation. A, sit listening to white jazz, plundering the room of our boredom until we imagine we may be guilty of someone else's asthma condition. And young man is telling you. And in the street, Sunday is coming, dressed up as the Black Masons Parade, moving down the wide boulevard, Jamaica, Long Island, amid the green trees whose moisture had dictated this memorandum. Everything go. The parade consisting of the silence around it, the march, the souls, a gold band in a green bugle call, ladies auxiliary, mason circles, straight lines, sequin duration, and black, as in it was a black day. Though tomorrow is Friday and can be what we want it. Becomes, they say, men will even be landing on other planets, such as the ones we cannot see. Daytime in Masonic fold or all sun, moon, and stars. What we see, expecting an optical illusion in a magazine, Mrs. Pretentious sends home a picture of a vase. The young man shows his friend who sees two faces, which shall be joined as one thing together. The strength of the nation, the glory of the creator, joined as one thing together. Any day of the week, decades, if we are ready for that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's about our time. We don't have any more time for talking. <laughs> Well, that's our problem right now. We always have to talk about that X because we can't find good examples of that already on this side of the watershed. Oh, yes, we can. Oh, oh let's see. Like, oh, what uh, about C. Wright? Richard Long and C. Wright would be an example of the hardware approach, yeah. which I think is going to find greater and greater problems. Yeah. And a, an example of the software system approach would be uh, Hans Hacke, the outstanding figure in the world, actually, from that point of view today. Two years later, the New York Times, April 27, 1971. Edward Fry, associate curator of the Guggenheim Museum, was dismissed by the museum's director yesterday in a controversy over the cancellation of a show by Hans Hacke, the artist, that was to have included photographs of Manhattan slums labeled with the names of the building's owners. The director added that the museum's charter called for aesthetic and educational objectives that are self-sufficient and without ulterior motive, and said the museum's policy was to exclude active engagement towards social and political ends. In 2009, 38 years after the firing of Edward Fry, the Colombian artist Doris Salcedo created this piece titled For Hans Hacke and Edward Fry. Salcedo borrowed the photos of the apartment buildings from Hacke himself and merged them with the atrium of the Guggenheim, assigned prints of the work sold recently for $7,500. One man who had a major influence was my friend Harry Smith, the filmmaker and music anthologist who was also a magician. Harry Smith was this guy. Jung's theories regarding synchronicity have recently turned out to be true. Okay. So I went to Harry. With the idea first came up to uh, get advice on how to exercise the Pentagon and levitate it. He advised us to circle the Pentagon with a trail of cornmeal and to consecrate the four directions, north, south, east, west. And it was Harry 
who advocated the use of a cow, which we acquired from a farm in Virginia, and we painted it to represent the Egyptian goddess Hathor, but uh, the authorities prevented us from bringing him. Uh, I, I put together some texts for the exorcism, stuff like, uh, we call upon the demons of the Pentagon to rid themselves of the cancerous tumors of the war generals. And I also made up a few lines in the fervor of the moment. I heard a ruckus behind me and turned to see Kenneth Anger freaking out under the truck calling for a violent demonstration. Yeah, Anger had a pentagram made of sticks and some tarot cards, things like that. He was not friendly. Uh, a guy from Newsweek tried to speak to him while he was busy with his magical ceremony, and Anger hissed at him like a snake. So uh, we just left them alone. What you're about to hear was recorded by New York City's WBAI on October 21st, 1967. The amulets of touching, seeing, groping, hearing, loving, we call upon the powers of the cosmos to protect our ceremonies in the name of Zeus, in the name of Anubis, God of the dead, in the name of all those killed for causes they do not comprehend, in the name of the lives of the dead soldiers in Vietnam who are killed because of their bad karma, in the name of seaborne Aphrodite, in the name of the Magna Mater Deo Medea, in the name of Dionysius, Jesus, Yahweh, Savob, in the name of the Unnameable, the Quinescent Finality, the Zoroastrian Fire, in the name of Hermes, in the name of the Beak of Sock, in the name of the Scarab, in the name of the Tyrone Power Pound Cake Society in the Sky, in the name of Ra, Osiris, Horus, Nepsis, Thesis, Ra, in the name of the Flowing, in the name In 2017, the Fugs released Exorcism of the White House, with Ed Sanders reprising his original chant in an attempt to levitate the White House, updating the lyrics to include references to the millions dead in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the East, and in the name of the blown apart Americans on war zones in the USA. Despite the band's best efforts, both 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and the Pentagon remain firmly attached to the ground to this very day. <laughs>